There we go. Sound. Fixed it. Um, okay, let's start again. The, um, welcome. Welcome to episode 222. It is the 222 episode. It is Saturday, um, November 6th. I'm actually feeling really frazzled this morning. So I just realized that I had all of community participation all like queued up and ready to go. And it's not in OBS. It's missing. It's gone. So I'm not sure what we're going to do because um, it's really hard to click through and uh, do that with you guys um, when I'm actually trying to like click around on the screen. So I'm not sure what we're going to do. We'll see what time it is and we'll see, we might have to save it for next week, which is really too bad. I had some fun stuff to show you. We are still on daylight time here in North America. So for those who have already switched in Europe to standard time, I'm envious, um, but we fall back tonight at 2 a.m. on Sunday morning. So we will be back to standard time next weekend and we'll all be back together. Um, the world will be united. <laughs> um, I actually prefer standard time because it follows the natural sunlight a lot closer. So um, on daylight time where the sun is in the sky is, is um, when it's right cresting in the middle of the sky in daylight time it's that's 1 p.m but that's not actually like how the clocks work it's actually 12 p.m 12 noon so um standard time follows the motion of the sun a lot cl more closely so i actually personally would prefer if we were just on standard time all the time um you know people are going to get up in the morning regardless of whether there's daylight or not and people turn on lights and like it doesn't matter um to the same extent especially in today's world like people are kind of operating outside of the sunlight hours anyways um so i would love to see us just stay on standard time but i don't know if that's ever going to happen um yeah if you're still having problems after we fix everything hit refresh and it'll reload everything for you um the other thing is we figured out this morning it was a, an issue uh previously and then it, it seemed to have sort of been fixed and now it seems to be an issue again um the patreon uh link where it says direct youtube link here on the post that comes up last night for the live stream when i changed the link on the word here it's supposed to update to the new link that I put in and it seems like that's not working again. So it was going on for a while and then it seemed to get fixed and now it seems to be happening again. You can always click on the banner that has the link as well. So if you have the email or you have the post and you're not on the Slack channel, you can always just click on the top banner of the post because that will take you to the live stream as well. But I will be sure to just start um, fixing that from now on. It just is kind of one of those weird programming things. Um, something's going on at the back end that um, is not very helpful. So um, yeah, Sharon, that's that's the thing. I always say pick a time and stay with it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, people are saying, I would hate to be on standard time during the summer. I enjoy our 10 p.m. light. Yeah, I, I totally get that. The, um, the thing is either, so sleep experts say we should either be on standard time all the time or we should be switching the clocks. We shouldn't stay on daylight time all the time because it actually, that messes with your circadian rhythm even more in the long term than standard time does. It's really interesting when you start to read um, the sleep expert stuff on the time change stuff. It's It kind of makes you think about it in a different way. It's really, really interesting. Um, looking forward to the extra hour of sleep. Me too. I work tomorrow, so it's nice to go in. It, it makes the day feel longer because you're still awake, um, but it just means you can kind of start a bit slower, which is kind of nice. Um, oh, welcome, Christine. She's able to join the live because she's on holiday this week. That's wonderful. I always feel for those like us who... Um, who um, work weekends. Um, yeah, so I hope that you guys are doing well. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to this place. If you are a new viewer, sorry about the sound at the beginning. That is not typical. It's just because I didn't turn on my mic. So thank you for your understanding. And thank you to those who are returning viewers and who continue to watch the show week after week. You guys are the ones that keep the show on the air, keep us um, going. And I just really appreciate you, you um, click, clicking the like and the subscribe button so that it 
um, shows up in other people's uh, feeds so that they can give the show a try as well. And of course, the Patreon community who are in the live chat today, you guys are the ones that keep the show on the on the air week after week, keep everything running. And I really appreciate um, your continued patronage and just the support of the work in this place. It's It means a lot to me. So I have a few things to share with you uh, today. I, I haven't done a lot of making this week. It's been a crazy week. I don't even know why. Like, it's just like James isn't done his schoolwork for the week. Um, Nora's still sleeping because she's so tired from whatever it was that she felt was so tiring. Um, Mike's not feeling great this morning. He took James off to, to soccer, but I know he's not feeling 100%. It's just kind of been like one of those weeks um, I've had a really good week, just kind of steady. Um, a friend of mine, she's one of my girlfriends that I grew up with actually, and our parents knew each other and, um, they are, um, um, sort of old family friends and her and I have just always known each other and reconnected. We didn't go to the same schools, but we reconnected when we did all of our lifeguarding stuff together. And so we've been friends sort of again, after being preschool friends and, and sort of early elementary friends because uh, our families went to the same church, we reconnected again when we were like 15, 16, and we've just kind of always been friends. There's a group of five of us that we all grew up together, and our families were all friends, and we are just still friends. Um, so she actually, they live in Kamloops now, so she came down um, with her family to see her parents, and her she brought her boys over yesterday morning, and they only stayed for an hour because it was just so crazy trying to like fit everything in but it was really good to see her and they're doing well and they've had a rough year. I think everybody's had a rough year. Can I get a here, here? Um, I think we all have sort of had, had a go, but it cut, it was one more thing that kind of cut into everything. So we also have the artisan sale this weekend for our guild. So, uh, some of our guild members that are part of our Patreon community, like my friend, Diana, um, Diana twist, who's usually here and very active in the chat. She's at the artisan sale this morning. So I will be going to floor walk, um, just to help people explain things, talk to people, um, later this afternoon, just to kind of do my part. So yeah, so I haven't really done anything. However, I have been sampling. So I would love to share with you some of my samples. Um, this has been a big hot topic in our OHS Unit 1 virtual group um, to help us and support us sort of getting through this first unit and getting going on our Master Weaver. So I will chat about that because um, I think it's actually quite interesting. And I got some plying done and I didn't get the bobbins cleared. So, you know, them's the breaks. So uh, let's get into the show and uh, we'll figure out what we're going to do about community participation. So I'll see you guys on the other side. Halloween anymore. I don't know why that popped in there. Um, it shouldn't. Mm, maybe I didn't delete that slide. That's so funny. Don't have a happy and safe Halloween because it's already happened. Well, you can do that next year. <laughs> um, yes. So lots of people having this year has been nuts. I'm ready for it to end says Maggie. Um, here, here says Julie and Hannah. Um, Chris is having a Halloween hangover. So that makes me feel a bit better that there's the Halloween slide at the end there. Um, oh, welcome Glenda. Uh, the, uh, I was also not having the greatest of weeks. Work has been wild, says, uh, Tessiana. And I had a great mail day today and some pretty hand painted fiber always helps. That's wonderful. Hard year. You help. Thanks, Sharon. I, I hope, um, I'm thinking about you. Mail days always perk me up no matter what. My yarn arrives so I can dress the loom for sampling. That's awesome, Amanda. So Amanda's been waiting for her yarn for unit one as well. So we'll talk about that in just a minute. Rebecca is close to being ready to do a big ply, so she needs some motivation. That's awesome. I hope you're sitting there plying right now, Rebecca. I'm, I'm watching you. We have a Zoom 
date coming up soon. Hopefully we can get that organized and you need to be all plied up. Um, we've had a run of COVID through the house, so it's been lots of quarantining craziness, trying not to get each other sick, ready for things to be back to normal. That's, I'm really sorry to hear that, Maggie. That's, that's really tough. Um, <laughs> Zan says, dear Amazon, 2021 is defective. I would like an exchange, please. Absolutely. Yeah. Just blame Amazon for it all. <laughs> if only it was that easy. Um, all right, so let's just have a look. Let's start with my cat bills because um, it's probably the easiest to talk about first and I have made progress. So this is my cat bells cardigan. This is a pattern, a lovely, lovely pattern by Megan Nodeker. She is local to me. Um, she's also the um, designer behind the brand, sort of the brand, if you will, Pip and Pin. Um, this is in some local to me wool and I keep forgetting to grab the, the the bands and I don't I don't have them here like I, I have no idea where they've gone that I keep forgetting to grab them for you guys but it's West Coast color um, so my friend Lynn this actually isn't her fiber though which is kind of neat so this yarn was processed at custom Willem Mills in Alberta but the clip was from my friend Anne's farm so these are her sheep and I was really hoping to have this done for today so I could wear it to the artisan sale but uh, to show Anne because it's like her sheep but, um, because Anne is very very involved with our guild she's um, our guild secretary she does a lot of extras every time we're striking a committee she puts her name forward she's incredibly generous with her time and um, she's just a lovely lady. Every time the kids go over there to her farm, um, she's just so generous with, with her time and her kindness to the kids. So um, this is a combination of uh, Romney, CVM, and Merino, I think, but I might be wrong and I keep forgetting to grab the tag, so I'm really sorry. I did, however, get the sleeve, one sleeve done this past week. Um, you basically, it's a drop, sleeve cardigan so for those who don't know what that is it means that there isn't really any proper armhole per se you cast on at the back neck and you knit down um, to start sort of the back yoke and then you go back and you pick up the fronts and you work down and then you connect everything and finish the body of the cardigan and it's a lovely garter lace pattern that's quite I had it memorized within about five stitches and uh, it's really intuitive it's easy and you just knit back and forth back and forth so really really lovely and then um, you pick up for your sleeves so you pick up around the garter and you work decreases all the way down and then you have these nice long ribbed cuffs that match the ribbing at the bottom and then there's actually pockets that go on here that are stockinette as well with a lovely ribbed band at the top I'm running really really low on yarn like I'm in the last skein and the my size calls for 1200 yards and I had exactly 1200 yards so I'm just really hoping that I've got enough but I'm already halfway through the sleeve and I'm decreasing steadily so I'm I'm thinking that I'll have enough yardage for the pockets um, Lynn has more of this yarn and Anne has a bit of it and so does Diana so I think I could probably piece together um, if I needed a, like a partial skein I could probably get it from somebody the other thing is that I shortened it by an inch or two. So the cardigan is supposed to be 24 inches long or 25 inches long. Something like that. It's quite long. 25 inches, I think, after you do the ribbing. And I stopped around 23, 22. Um, because the garter is going to grow in the wash water. And um, it just gets to be too long. Like this cardigan was um, uh, 18 inches or 19, 19 inches, I think. 19 or 20 inches and it's kind of about right so this is meant to be longer and it's meant to be sort of boxy and it's meant to be um sort of you know drapey um but I sort of thought like once you get to I'm not I'm not that tall I'm 5'5 five five. I'm, I'm sort of on the shorter side so um once you start getting to that length for me I just don't need it it doesn't it's not super super flattering for me you either have to go super long or I need to go sort of moderate so yeah, so that's the cat bell. So I'm really, I am really enjoying that knit. It's been a lovely, um, 
it's been lovely to work on. Uh, we're at the swimming pool on Fridays for an hour and 15 minutes. And then by the time the kids get changed and get showered and stuff, it ends up being about an hour and a half. And um, I actually worked on this yesterday. So this is actually, the sleeve is all of that knitting in an hour and 15 minutes. That's pretty good. So um, I'll probably have that done this weekend because I'll take it to work tomorrow. Um, it is buttonless Kelly great question. It's just an open front. It's kind of a bit like slouchy baggy kind of looking um, I would almost call this uh, a sweater. That's almost kind of asexual. It's not necessary It's not a super super feminine cardigan. It's not super masculine It's just kind of a cardigan like anybody could wear it I I really like that about some of these patterns. I find the Brooklyn tweed patterns are very much like that um, they're they're just they're just clothes. They're not kind of, you know, they're not overtly one way or the other. And I'm finding that I, I really like that utilitarian kind of, you know, that I could pass this on to a friend and, um, they would probably enjoy it. It wouldn't matter. It, you know, just kind of getting away from, from a bunch of labels of this is for women. This is for men. This is for this. This is for this. It's, it's just an easy, easy cardigan to wear. Anybody could wear it as, as a jacket. My mom would wear this, you know what I mean? So, um, and that's saying something because my mom basically just wears black, black t-shirts, black sweatshirts, that's it. Um, so, you know, she just wants really functional, useful stuff that she can do her artwork. If she gets paint on herself, you won't see it. Um, so it's, yeah, just really utilitarian, just really useful. Mm. Great question, Rebecca. What sweater are you wearing? So I am wearing the, it's a, it's called the boyfriend. It was a Stephanie Japel pattern. Um, so I'll just step back. Um, this is, I, I knit this like back in 2017, I think. And the, it's out of some tweed that I got. I bought the yarn. Um, and so it's, it's a V neck. So it, it buttons like that. So once it's all buttoned, I never wear it buttoned. Um, that's kind of how it's supposed to wear. I guess I could put it like that, I guess. Um, but a cardigan like this, I tend to just wear open. Um, and I would put a scarf with it usually. Um, so it's the boyfriend by Stephanie Japel. I don't know if you guys remember, I don't know that she's still designing, but she was huge for a while there and did, um, a lot of everything she did was raglan and she had this great raglan like pattern book. Anyways, this was from Nitty. It was a free pattern. And, um, one of the things that I really liked about it was, um, uh, I plugged it into custom fit by Amy Herzog and got my exact numbers for my shape at that time. And then it spit out, um, what I needed to do to knit. And it's kind of funny because the beehive wool shop in Victoria, um, is a great, a great shop. If you're ever in Victoria, British Columbia, you have to go there. Um, and if you're not a spinner and you're just a knitter, um, not just, but if you are, you know, if knitting is your primary and you tend to be a yarn, like they've got some great yarn. Anyhow, we were in Victoria with my brother and sister-in-law and I didn't have anything to work on. So I went to the beehive, got the yarn, got the needles, and it was just yarn that like it's, it's a, it's an, it's a wool acrylic, um, a wool nylon blend. And it's not something that I would normally purchase, but I was kind of desperate for a pattern and I knew I wanted to cast this on and to make this. And, um, I had it knit within like, I want to say like a week or two. It was a really, really fast knit. And I kind of just banged it off. Here is my Ravelry project page. And then you guys can follow the links from there. So this was, it's great. Grinashko. Loden, that was the yarn and I knitted on five millimeter needles. Yeah. And then I sewed the button bands on afterwards. So I did a, a one by one rib for the button bands and I sewed them on after. So they, they're a bit strange at the top where the cast on is. Um, it, it, it's not quite, you guys won't even be able to see it. It's just me being nitpicky right here. It's not quite right, but you know, once you've got it on and you're wearing it, there's just a pucker there, but you, like nobody else would know uh, it's only me because you know, picky, nitpicky. I'm nitpicky sometimes. Okay. So let's talk about my sampling. 
Oh, morning, Priscilla. Good to see you. So I did get some plying done this week. I can't remember if I shared this with you guys last week or not. Um, I'm just going to move the camera over so that I can move over. Um, this was my CVM. It's the beginning of my plying. I still have more to go. It's the singles that I spun up a couple of weekends ago to just spin through the rest of my CVM. This has ended up being about 16 wraps per inch. I have not have I washed this yet? I have not washed this yet. Uh, it's just so much yarn. And um, it's about 900 yards prior to washing. So there will be loss. But I'm curious to see what this kind of puffs up to. I'm wondering about putting it with some of my other yarns that I've made recently, especially this year, because they're all kind of the same weight and the same kind of scrunchy, soft, you know, soft spun kind of woolly feel. Um, that I might actually combine them into a sweater that I've been planning for quite a while called the Grey Roop. Um, it's a pattern by uh, Camilla Vad, and um, the. Do you have your breakfast? Sorry, guys. Nora just woke up. That's wonderful. She slept so long, and she's just woken up. Nora, your breakfast. Yeah, you can make a fort. Um, I put them on the bookshelf. Sorry, sweetie. And did you see your breakfast? <laughs> so what we do on Saturday morning, if she's not awake yet, is I make a tray and I put her breakfast on it for her and it's at her door so she can stay in her bed if she wants or she could bring her tray downstairs and she can eat downstairs. Um, but it means that she doesn't have to get out of bed and get out of like, you know, her warm, cozy little nest. Um, I always think of the kids' beds as like their nests. There's so many stuffies in there that they really are nesting. Um, so anyway, so uh, the Grey Roop is a pattern by Camilla Vada. Just put it in the live chat. And I've been kind of slowly collecting yarns for it because it's this wonderful color work sweater where you change color as you work your way down the body. And um, I had originally swatched with some yarns that I had in my stash that would have been perfect from a natural shades perspective to give some contrast between the color work. However, the... Um, the problem with it ended up being the, the gauge was, the yarns were just a bit too thick. They were all three ply. They were all very round. They were lovely sweater yarns. Like they'd be great for a sweater, but they need to be at a worsted gauge. And the pattern is more of like a, a sport DK gauge. So the yarns are just that little bit too dense that it changes the gauge of the pattern just enough that I would have to do some math. And when you're dealing with charts and color work charts, I don't want to do that much math. Um, call it laziness, call it whatever. There's too many patterns out there that would be really appropriate. One pattern that I would really like to remake is actually the throwback. Um, oh yeah, that's great, Nora is actually the throwback by Andrea Maori because I've knit it once already in my, that Rambouillet yarn that I was um, testing for West Coast Color. And I'm really tempted to pull that out and remake it and remake that yarn into something because the, the, the sort of the jacket of the throwback cardigan, like it is just so big on me. I don't know where I went wrong. I'm not sure what happened with my gauge and what happened with the knitting, but it's just so big. So, um, anyways, there's sort of this conversation going on in my head and going on at the back of my head where, um, some of these yarns that I have that are really wonderful sweater yarns that would be, you know, they're a little bit more soft spun. They wouldn't be great for warp. They're too, they're too elastic. They're too bouncy and too stretchy. They have too much loft. They're too airy. They were spun long draw like this. Uh, where if I could combine them together, they would make a couple of like really great sweaters um, that I could wear as like layering pieces because what I'm finding is we get rain, but that rain is damp and you you need something underneath, but you don't want a big cardigan. You want something that's more of like um, a, a sort of a thinner sweater that's going to keep you warm. Uh, and color works perfect because you get kind of that double knitting kind of effect where you've got that two layers of fabric with your floats going on behind you. So that's just some of the things that I'm thinking about in the back of my the back of my mind. Alongside that is are these other two spins that I finished. So this is my Hello Yarn. What was it? What was the? Um, it was called spelt. Yes, it was a club colorway. So the end of this, all of this here is actually chain plied. 
So this was all chain plied at the end, but this is the traditional three ply down here. And I spun it on my uh, Magicraft because it's a Magicraft bobbin. The plying went really quickly. I was really surprised, but this bobbin is full. Um, this is really heavy. It's all four ounces. I, for whatever reason, when I divided up my singles, one of the, uh, sorry, when I divided up the fiber, when I was spinning the third sort of bundle of fiber ended up that bobbin when I rewound it. And we talked about plying this yarn on the wool circle this past Tuesday on the live stream. So that's for Wool Circle members on, on Patreon when you're navigating. There's two live streams a month that we do together where we actually get on the wheel and talk about talk about these techniques in real time so that you can ask questions in real time. Um, for whatever reason, there was quite a bit of singles left on the third uh, bobbin when I rewound them. So I ended up just chain plying rather than trying to make a, trying to redistribute them and make make more three ply. I was like, I have a lot enough three ply. This is, this is going to, going to be a lot of a, a lot of yarn um and you know it'll be great either as color work um uh, i'm not actually totally sure what i'm going to do with it i just love the colorway and I, I wanted to get it spun and then i also got my ultra fine alpaca spun so i rewound the bobbins i wasn't super happy with how the colors matched up um, I was really hoping that they would match up a little bit better and that there would sort of be these long slow transitions of color but for whatever reason, um, probably my own mismanagement because I just, I couldn't remember with this one, I talked about it a little bit. It was quite full and I couldn't strip it down and pre-draft it or anything. So I kind of, I just spun it from the top. We went through it twice on the live stream. I think we did it at Thanksgiving and then we did it again a couple of weeks ago. And I showed how I spin across the top and how um, how fine the singles were. And I was doing this on my Kromsky Minstrel and I had to get my Kromsky cleared off for air to to start spinning flax on it again and um because i really like the distaff on the Kromsky and be able to spin off the distaff for for my flax so when i went to rewind it and i divided the singles in half it just nothing matched up it just didn't work and um i thought about you know moving the singles around and trying to rewind them and trying to kind of get them back to some other way and try to kind of manipulate them a little bit and then i was like you know what this has kind of been one of those spins that was a little bit frustrating and um, let's see what the yarn looks like once it's plied up because all of this barber pulling in here that I have to admit it's not my favorite when it's knit up it's actually really really pleasing and that's something that I've really had to take a moment in my spinning just to, to remind myself of when I see that really stark barber pulling some people love it and they love that aesthetic but for me it's 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 not my favorite um, I've always said that but in the knitting I really really like it so I actually think this would be really pretty in something like the Montana mountain cowl it might be really nice in some of those other color work uh, cowls that are that are knit in a tube and then you graph them at the end uh, because it's fine but with two layers of, of you know with knitting it in the round and knitting a tube it would actually be really lovely against your neck and around your neck and I don't seem to be sensitive to this at all I seem to have um, a sensitivity to alpaca that's not really really clean that seems to be the problem because this was no problem at all and it was dyed um, and I'm wondering if that just that dyeing and processing of it and whatnot, um, if it just got it that little bit cleaner and got rid of that little bit of dander that I'm usually sensitive to. Super interesting. Mm. Josie agrees. I think it will be beautiful knitted. Um, yarns look so different sometimes after it is knitted. Absolutely, Suzanne. Yes. Um, I need another yarn club like, like I need a hole in my head, but that is lovely. I know, I know what you mean, uh, Taziana. I, I actually am only a member of one fiber club now. I, I cut way, way back. And um, I'm actually even thinking about dropping that one as well. It's just too much. Um, and co having that constant stream of fiber coming into the home, um, it ends up being stashed. And I end up kind of with this amassed amount of fiber with no clear reason to spin it or project to spin it for so I'm kind of ending up with a lot of fiber that I just am not going to get through so I might have to make the hard decision to to quit the the one that that I am in this is actually laying here just because this is my Polworth and silk spin that I'm working on right now it's the one that we demoed last week 
from uh, West Coast Color. And uh, we, we did it on the e-spinner. Uh, I showed it right here. I was kind of had the e-spinner right here and I spun the camera around. So if you guys are interested in, in seeing seeing that and, and seeing some chat about the e-spinner, please, please have a look at the last um, episode. I did play around with these though. Um, this is the four ply and I wrote down sort of what the elasticity is. These numbers are not correct. I have to go back and redo them. It's more like seven and a half percent. Um, I think this one was like 2.5%. Uh, they're really, really low in terms of how elast elastic they are. Uh, they, they haven't been washed and finished though. So it'll be really interesting to see how the elasticity changes once I wash and finish them. But those numbers are not correct. I wrote them down and then I was like, no, no, that's not, I'm not doing the math correctly. So um, that's not actually the elasticity. If it was 50% elastic, that means that from this length here, would then be added another 50%. Like I would be able to pull this out from here. I would be able to pull it, pull this all the way out 50% of this current length. And like, that's not the case. It stretched like 0.5% or uh, sorry, 0.5 inches, which is not, you guys get what I'm saying. So I have to redo, just write down the, the numbers. Um, I just was doing it really quickly in my head and kind of, kind of uh, messed up. All right, the camera shifted. Let's talk about my OHS sampling. So this is some weaving chatter and we do talk about weaving on the show more and more over the last few years. I don't know if you guys have noticed, we've sort of slowly increased our, our, our knitting chatter while, while Patreon and the live stream, the, the, the wool circle live stream and our virtual spin groups and our queries and explorations groups are all sort of dedicated to spinning. The podcast, I, I get to talk about what I'm working on. So that more and more is weaving. Um, and the reason for that is that for those who haven't sort of been around and been, uh, been part of the community, um, maybe as long as others, I started working on my OHS, uh, which is the Ontario hand weavers and spinners, um, uh, guild, um, the OHS, the, the Ontario Hand Weavers and Spinners Guild, uh, uh, master, master weaver program. The reason why I started working on it was twofold actually. The first was for the knowledge. Um, it's an independent self-study program and I really wanted to sort of embark on a journey of self-study where I could be the architect of what I learn and how I learn it, but where I had sort of a curriculum coming at me saying these are the things that you need to be able to master and be able to do, but how you get there is up to you. And I really liked that idea. Whereas with the Canadian Guild of Weavers, with their um, certificate, with their master, master weaver, they give you all of what's expected at the end and what you need to submit, but it's completely independent. Like you're not even supposed to have a mentor or a teacher. Uh, you can be in a study group where you're learning together, but you, you can't sort of go to somebody and say, teach me all these things and then I'll submit all of my samples. You're not supposed to do that. So, um, one of the things about the, about unit one, it is one of the heaviest units. And part of that is because you're looking at basic weaves, uh, basic structures. So plain weave, and you're looking at twills. So there's a lot of samples and the, the crazy thing is, is that with the twills, I mean, the samples that they give you to do are kind of just the beginning. Like you, you could, you could do so much more, um, than just what they give you in, in the package to submit. I mean, you could make twills your, your magnum opus, right? Like you could just keep going and, and, and keep developing more and more and more, um, knowledge around just twills and you know, what your set is and, and you know, different yarns and you could make a whole project out of just exploring the twills and what they can do. Um, so one of the comments in our, in our virtual group on Thursday night was actually around set. Cause that's been the primary conversation is, is like, what, what do you, what do you set your yarns at? So the set for those who don't know is where you thread your heddles. So whether you're on a table loom or a floor loom, it doesn't really matter. Um, even a rigid heddle, you're going to thread everything, but on a rigid heddle, you've got just the one heddle and whatever those, the spacing is of those slots and holes, cause you don't, you, we don't need to get into sort of the technical for those who are just learning, um, all of those slots and those holes that are on your rigid heddle on that heddle of your, um, loom, 
is also going to determine your set because you're going to choose your read, that's what it's called, um, based on what you want your yarns to be set at. So you can choose you know, a 7.5 dent read and that means that there's seven and a half slots per inch. Um, you can choose another one and order another one that's 15. So you have 15 slots per inch. So the rigid heddle sort of combines your, your, your heddles, your read, and your set all into sort of one piece, one piece of equipment. But on a floor loom and on a table loom, your heddles and your read are separate. So you thread your heddles and you thread your heddles, you know, in the pattern that you want. But then your read, you slay, that's what it's called, slaying with your hook. And slay hooks look like all different kinds of things, but this is an example of an older Leclerc slay hook. And you slay through your read based on what you want your set to be. So that's the number of ends, your, your warp threads, how many per inch you have. So for this sample, I slayed my read um, at 10 ends per inch. And it was really interesting because um, I ended up, what you can do when you're sampling is you can actually cut that off and you can re-slay at a different set. So you can put your warp threads further apart or you can put them closer together and that changes your fabric. So that was one of the things that I sort of decided to just slow down, stop, reassess, get over the roadblock in my head of it takes so much time to re-slay, it takes so much time to cut off and it takes so much warp to cut off. I just let that go. And I decided that if it took more warp, it took more warp. This is a, a, an experiment. We are learning something and we are also reframing how we learn and how we sort of what our previous knowledge was and how can we reframe it into usable knowledge going forward. What can I learn from this experiment? I also changed my colors. So I'm just gonna go back a set, uh, uh, just a sec before I get into these samples. I actually changed my colors. So on the, on the unit one, it gives you three options for what you can do for your, uh, for your project. So you can go red, yellow, blue. You can choose a harmony triad or you can choose a split complement uh, triad. So you can you can do whatever you want. You just need to write in your in your notes uh, why you chose what you chose and, and what you ended up going with. So I started off with red, yellow, blue. Those were my first two warps. And then my third warp, I decided I have to redo my samples anyways. So I'm gonna go to a magenta, yellow and cyan or cobalt, um, sorry, uh, cyan, um, uh, primary color, um, color wheel instead. And the reason for that was actually because I had been working with the red, yellow, blue the whole time and had, had woven through two warps that were in total about 11 yards of yarn. And I just ended up thinking, I would love to see these colors and see the color wheel side by side in the other color wheel in the in the other primary colors so and i had magenta already and i had the yellow and i ended up i've i've had to get more yarn anyway so i thought well i'll order the blue and it'll just give me a chance to sort of see the differences this is also the color wheel that most of us look at every day when we're working on screens and when we're working in um, anything digital so i thought you know if having a deeper understanding of these colors would actually be really helpful the reason why I wanted to show you guys this sample was because if I had kept these original samples, this actually would have been one that I would have submitted. Um, this ended up working really, really, really well. So this is my straight draw, and this is called extended twill, extended reverse twill. So you're working your twill in one direction for a while, and then you work in the other direction, and then the other direction. And this ended up being off the loom completely by, by chance, because I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, this ended up being totally balanced. Um, it ended up being 14 ends, so that's your warp threads, 14 ends by 14 picks. And it just is lovely. And, you, and it looks lovely because it's totally balanced. So you see an equal amount of the warp and you see an equal amount of the weft. And it just, it, it's very pleasing to the eye. This was a, the reverse twill 
uh, treadling, so the, the movement of the feet or the movement of the hinges of the paddles on the table loom in this same pattern, because it goes all the way across, right? Your weft goes all the way across, but on a threading of broken twill. So that's what you get, which actually is very pleasing. I quite like that. And then that same threading on a point twill. And what I really like about this with against the orange, it's the red against the orange, is um, it kind of creates like a cranberry, which I think is really pretty from a distance. Even in real life, this looks very cranberry. This is very close to what it actually looks like in real life, which which I really, I really like. Using the orange on the blue just gave me lots of uh, contrast. It wasn't because I particularly like that complement combination, but so that the marker can actually see the difference um, and can actually measure because they have to do their own measurements of your work. Um, they can actually see you need high contrast. So the chat is going crazy. So let me just catch up with you guys. Um, all right. So let me see. Got a floor loom this year, enjoying the learning curve, says Sharon, following Jane Stafford in the School of Sweet Georgia. That's a wonderful place to start, uh, Sharon. That's just awesome. I'm sorry that you guys were having trouble. If you're having trouble with the links and it's right before eight o'clock, hit refresh because I probably fixed fixed the post. Um, so just a little a little note because yeah, I'm sorry that, that that link wasn't working. I don't I I we had talked about it at the beginning of the live stream, but of course, of course you guys missed it. I'm really sorry. Um I kept updating the link and fixing it, but but there was there's some sort of a programming issue at the end of, at the back end of Patreon where it didn't work. So really sorry. Um, I'm going to learn to do twill on my rigid heddle. That's my goal. That's awesome, Kelly. You'll have to take photos of having your uh, two uh, heddles set up. Uh, Dagmar says I'm not a weaver, but I like to see what can be done with it. Absolutely. Um, I've asked for a rigid heddle loom for Christmas after watching some of the uh, School of Sweet Georgia classes. I don't know what I'll do with it besides scarves, but it'll be fun to have a new challenge. You know what? The other thing, Taziana, you'll learn a lot about your hand spun yarns. If you have, um, once you do a couple of things with some of your stashed commercial yarn, if you jump um, on your, on with your uh, hand spun after that, you'll start to really learn about a lot about your yarns and, and changes that you want to make in your spinning. Uh, Elizabeth says, I do not consider myself a weaver, but I would like to make a wool woven skirt. Me too. Um, and actually Megan's made a couple, which are just so inspiring. Have done a few cotton projects. Yes. In some ways I find weaving with cotton easier than weaving with wool in some ways, but the more that I work with the wool, the more I'm enjoying it. I don't think I said what this yarn was. So this is Briggs and Little Sport. This is their singles yarn. And um, the, the requirements for the unit one is actually to weave within a certain yards per pound. So this is a little bit, a little bit heavier. The, it has a slightly lower grist at 1740 yards per pound. And the OHS um, had originally wanted everybody to go within 18 yards per pound, but they had to open things up because of COVID, yarn availability, all that stuff. So this is all Briggs and Little Sport. And actually, unfortunately, I've had to order quite a few batches of yarn because of needing more yarn and needing more warp yarn. And so I just add a couple in every single time. So this is the stash of Briggs and Little Sport that I have sort of amassed. I've got every single color it feels like. The sort of bare minimum that you need are your three warp colors plus uh, six, uh, no, plus three other hues or colors and um, to sort of make your make your stuff and I've sort of ended up with um, with all of those hues and then I have a few different shades of green and a sh few different shades of uh, purple just for that contrast on the warp so let me share with you um, this first one so this is set set at so after I changed my colors and changed my warp this is totally dry so this was set at 10 ends per inch and this is what I did all of my original sampling on so all of these original samples, this is basket rib. This is um, all set at 10 ends per inch. And it's really interesting because now knowing what I know, coming back to this, um, it's actually not, this is, this was washed and, and it's fulled, but it's only fulled where there's the, the interlacements, where the threads cross. I can still in these corners and in these, I can still get my fingers through there. And, um, it's interesting to me because this was set at 10 ends per inch. It is not a balanced weave off the loom after washing and finishing. 
and I sort of started to pick up on the fact that the 10 ends per inch is just not quite dense enough. It makes a nice fabric. This would make a great scarf something really super drapey, but it's not quite the right set for this yarn. So I had done all this sampling at 10 ends per inch. And the more I worked with it, the more I realized that part of the reason why I was getting, having difficulty getting a balanced weave. So 50, 50, um, where your ends per inch match your picks per inch post washing was because I was actually setting it too loose. And, um, the finished fabric was just, it's, it's, drapey it would be lovely for a scarf like this would just be fantastic for a scarf and then to fold that and maybe put it in the in the dryer for a few minutes or you know really get it to bloom that would be lovely but it's just a bit too open for these samples and here's one of my plain weave samples this was the stripe repeat and again it's really quite lovely I really like it but you can see it's it's holy right so that was a really good experiment to go through that because then I beat down really hard and this is at 14 ends per uh, picks per inch. So there's 14 um, put in there uh, on that on that same sleigh at 10 ends at 10 ends per inch and then I and then I did the 14 picks. So I really beat it down and you can see that it becomes a a, a weft faced fabric. The weft starts to take over. This is balanced um, at 10 and 10. And you can see that the sea foam and the blue um, are, are, it's 50-50. Over here it's 50-50. You can see equal amounts of weft and, and warp. And here, um, I know the colors are very similar and they're very close, but it's very pleasing. But here it starts to become weft dominant, which is really fascinating. And, and again, it's not a balanced weave post finishing, but I wanted to see what it would happen. And then this is red on um, the um, on the the for the weft. Sorry, you guys, I just kind of had a bit of a brain fart um, on the weft. And this was 12 picks. So this is 10, 14 and 12 picks on 10 ends per inch. And again, it becomes more, more weft dominant. You can see the warp in there, but off loom and after finishing, it becomes 13 picks. And, um, it just, yeah, it's, it's too, it's getting better in terms of the, the, um, the density of the fabric. It feels nicer. This would be a great, um, uh, coat. Um, a lightweight coat, not, not a heavy, heavy coat, but a really nice coat, but it's, um, um, it's not balanced. So I went back to the drawing board. Thank you for allowing me to wax poetic about this. You guys, um, I'm Tracy says I'm eager to finish weaving for this craft fair next weekend. So I can start to play with hand spun weaving. That's amazing. Um, do you remember offhand the Briggs and Little color names for the magenta and blue that you bought? Uh, yep. So this was yellow and this was magenta. Um, they were actually called that. And this one is called light blue. Um, you can also get cobalt, but it wasn't available. So, uh, yeah, color, color, color availability is an issue. So this one is really interesting. And actually, I don't know if I have my notes right here. But um, basically the fawn ended up being, so I re-slayed. I cut off that you can see my slay. Um, I lashed on. So for those who are cutting off and re-slaying and, and pulling stuff off and on, this is all I lost for my warp um, from re-slaying. It's not that much. It's like a couple of inches. And out of a yard that's 36 inches, like a couple of inches is not a big deal. So I, re I, I did a lash on. So if you guys don't know how to lash on, definitely learn how to do that. Um, because this fawn in here ended up being 11 and 11 and it's really lovely. It's a lovely fabric. Um, and I ended up with, with a really good result. This is still damp. Um, but it, it's just, in my opinion, it's, it's perfect. It's, it's a 50, 50, it's balanced. You can see warp and weft. Um, it looks really nice. This was really firm. Um, this was really, really firm. I just wanted to see what would happen at that point. I was all about the measuring and the experimentation. It was like, what can I do with this warp? How can I push it in, in different directions now, now that I'm kind of, you know, doing this experiment. 
The other interesting thing was at the at this really nice set, I my salvages fixed themselves. So you can see in some of this other stuff that the salvages aren't 100%. And um, one, as I got closer and closer to the right set, I ended up with a nicer and nicer uh, salvage. And you know that was with no micromanagement, not touching them, just throwing the shuttle, setting my weft yarn, beading, change, back and my salvages just kind of started to fix themselves um, which i think is actually very very uh telling about making sure that our yarns are set at the right set there was a comment in our ohs meeting on thursday night uh from alice and she said uh your set is so there's the science of weaving and then your set is the art of weaving and i just love that i kind of want to like like frame that to remind and put it above my loom to like remind myself how important this is and felicia and i were kind of joking with each other uh when we were chatting the other day about um how uh we have kind of become obsessed with measuring and now i'm kind of starting to get obsessed with measuring my hand spun too <laughs> So hence all of these like all of these measurements and you guys will notice in the um, how I spin content for November coming up on I think it's releasing on Monday if my memory serves um, in the PDF there's like charts and it's all measured and there's like elasticity measurements and, and um, bumps per inch and like I'm just getting obsessed with measuring so you can see how excited I get about this stuff. So this was really interesting because this is basket weave. So I'm not sure if you guys can see it all the way back there, but this is basket weave. So this is two by two. And this was sort of when things got really interesting because um, down here, you would think that this would be really balanced, but it's actually not. Um, this is actually um, beat really, really tight. And the picks per inch don't match the ends per inch. And then up here, you've kind of got the opposite problem where you've got a balanced weave, but it's not quite as... Uh, close set. Um, I'm almost tempted to go down to 12 ends per inch with this and see if see if it kind of works itself out. So you might need different sets for different weave structures. So I might pull this off um, and just see um, wait and do it when I do my twills and see if see if the results are any different. Josie is asking if I block my weaving in the sewing machine in the washing machine. Uh, it becomes more of a fabric just a cool wash. Um, I do, I, I, I would have um, up to this. Um, with this, I wanna have a little bit more control than in the washing machine. I'm a little bit concerned about putting it into the washing machine. However, I am tempted to put this one in the washing machine and just see what happens. I have a Mila um, and I bought it specifically when we needed to replace our washing machines, which actually I ended up talking about on the podcast when it was happening. Um, because I wanted the wool wash. And so I am actually kind of tempted to cut this off of this other sample underneath because I didn't hem stitch this one. I'm just going to surge it and throw this one in the washing machine and just kind of see what happens once I get all my measurements off of it because um, it is kind of an interesting um, uh, question. Uh, one of the really, a really, really helpful resource has been Laura Fry's Finishing uh, Magic in the Water. It's on Long Thread Media for those who are interested. She did her entire final project for her GCW, so her Canadian Guild of Weavers Master Certificate. She did that on finishing. And um, it's a fascinating video to watch some of, some of what she did and her knowledge and why she did what she did and her reasoning. What style of loom do you recommend starting with? Asks Heather. I was tempted to go straight to a table loom, but I'm wondering if a rigid heddle would be better. I'm afraid I'm too limited in patterns. So that's a great question, um, Heather, because um, uh, the I started on a rigid heddle, and um, if you guys will sort of allow me to sort of wax poetic for a minute about this, we we haven't really talked about this very much on the podcast. I've sort of mentioned here and there, oh yeah, you know, this came off the rigid heddle and this came off the table loom and this came off the floor loom and oh, I'm selling my rigid heddle and oh, I've got a compact, oh, but I sold that. And I just kind of mention it like in passing. So if you guys will sort of entertain me for just a moment, let me just go through real, really quickly uh, my kind of my progression and, and what I would recommend if I were starting out knowing what I know now which is kind of part of part of the reason for you know podcasting and sharing all this with you guys is that you don't have to go through all of these bumps that I've gone through and you also get excited and fired up to try this stuff and to do this stuff. So 
The rigid heddle gives you a really great starting point. If you don't know if weaving is for you, it gives you an affordable entry point that you can do some plain weave. Uh, if you want to, like Kelly, you can throw a second heddle on and you can do some twills and you really have to start to learn about st structure if you start to do that and you put two heddles on and you, because you have to understand where the shuttle is going to create what you want to create. So that really starts to f form a really solid foundation of structure, fabric structure. How do you make these fabrics? However, you are limited in the sense that if you want to get into more advanced weaving and you don't necessarily just want to knit, weave with your commercially stashed yarns or your hand spun, you want to work with fine cottons, you want to work higher than 15 ends per inch. So we were talking earlier about your set. Um, most of the rigid heddles, um, and unless you start getting into double um, the double heddles where you've got two heddles and you can double slay so that you can go up to 30. Um, that gets really complicated. So for those who are just kind of finding out information, don't worry if you don't understand what I just said. But if you want to work outside of sort of seven and a half to 15 ends and you, and you only want to work in that set, then a rigid and you want to make scarves and you maybe want to do some placemats. You want to kind of dabble in a little bit of four, eight cotton to make some placemats and some table runners. Um, it's a great rigid heddles are, there's a lower barrier to entry. You can get started really quickly. There are some phenomenal resources online like yarn worker, Liz Gibson's work. And uh, she's on Patreon. Her stuff is on point. It's amazing. It's well thought out. It's clear. It's concise. Um, she has a very engaged group and a very engaged community. So she is just a wonderful, wonderful resource. And there are others out there that are doing, um, doing stuff as well. So I started on the rigid heddle. I started with a 32 inch wide loom. And I was really quite happy with that for the first couple of projects. And then after that, I started to run into problems because I wanted to do twills. I wanted to do some more complicated stuff. I was starting to read a little bit more. And what I really wanted to do was tea towels. So I needed something wider and, um, my 32 would have worked, but I wouldn't have been able to weave at 18 or 20 ends per inch without starting to get into double heddles. And I just wasn't sure that that was really what I wanted to do. I also belong to a very active, very knowledgeable guild here in the Fraser Valley. And I had a couple of people that were willing to help me and were willing to teach me and get me started. So that got me onto a Jane table loom. It was this 27 inch wide one. And that started to teach me about how shafts move, how they lift and lower, how to throw a shuttle, uh, how to beat. And that was really wonderful. And then from there, I started looking for a, t a floor loom. I was able to find the Leclerc compact, which I have since sold to make room for the Louette spring that I found third hand. And it's a 12 harness, uh, sorry, it's a 12 shaft, 14 treadle loom and like I'll never outgrow it. I'll it's it's like it does every, it'll do everything that I can ever want. With 12 shafts lifting and lowering and 14 treadles, I'll I'll never need anything else. I also was able to secure a Leclerc Jack 45 inch wide loom. So that's a four shaft loom with six treadles and that does pretty much everything that I need and want. So Heather, what I would and I sold um and then I also ended up with the table loom just a little one, but that one is for, and it's H eight, eight shaft. Um, and the reason for that was for sampling and round robins at the guild, being able to do some more portable stuff, taking it on the road with us. So that one sort of stays, it's, it's set up right now, but I'm probably going to put it away for the, for the next little while, just to free up some floor space. Um, I basically go back and forth between my Jack and my spring. And I generally have a project on both at all times. What I would recommend is to figure out what you want to weave. What is your long-term goal and get that. So if your long-term goal is to weave twills, plain weave, dabble in some other stuff that you can do on four or eight shaft, then start looking for something that fits in your space that is affordable. Um, you know, for, for 
used looms from the 70s and 80s, you should be paying about $100 per shaft. So it's a four shaft loom, somewhere between four and $600 is probably about right, depending on where you are and how many are available. Ontario and Quebec, Leclerc looms are a dime a dozen. You can get them for a lot cheaper. Out here, not so much. Some, some looms are just exorbitantly expensive and they're an investment. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you want to spend $15,000 on a loom, you can, but it's probably going to be your primary thing that you do. Um, so as you work backwards, I would personally try to figure out what the lowest barrier of entry is, how much you're willing to spend and invest in this new thing and how much time you realistically have to learn the new thing. Because, uh, for me personally, just the time alone that I have spent on my OHS stuff, I'm basically spending an hour to two hours every day on this study. So from September all the way through to now, an hour every day for 60 plus days, I have spent 60 plus hours. And I would say it's probably close to 100 hours. So yeah. Um... Tazania says, thank you for this conversation. You're so welcome. Dorothy's asking how you finish your samples. Um, so with these ones, Dorothy, I've been putting them in really hot water um, and swishing them around and kind of giving them a scour. Um, and then I just started playing around with some different fulling techniques. So this one was beat and thwacked. Um, this one, not as aggressively, but it's because I was wondering what would happen with the basket weave. And then I've been um, um, allowing them to dry. This one, the basket weave, I pinned. Um, so that I would see what, what was going to happen with my, with my edges. Um, Nathalie says I started on with a table loom, but I wish I had started with a rigid heddle. I think I would have gotten started with weaving sooner because it was such a steep learning curve. So Nathalie, I think that is a really, really good, um, comment. I think that's actually a really important comment. I was talking to some friends about this recently. Um, I, I feel like with knitting and spinning, the barrier to entry is quite a bit lower. If you're a knitter, you sort of have some understanding of yarn. You have some understanding of wool versus cotton versus acrylic. You have some basic general ideas of sort of, you know, where the wool maybe comes from, especially nowadays. There's so much information out there about fiber sheds and uh, farm to yarn and small batch mills. And like, there's just so much information. And so I think when people come into spinning, yes, there's the investment of your spinning wheel if you decide to go that route, but the barrier is lower in terms of knowledge because you're coming with a little bit of knowledge already. With weaving, there's a barrier to entry in terms of the cost of your equipment, but there's also a barrier to entry in terms of knowledge. And that is almost bigger than the financial jump because for some people they start to weave and after about the first six inches they're like really I'm gonna do this for the next 500 inches like really this is it and they're sort of they feel let down and they feel like oh my goodness like this is this is not that fun after the first six or eight inches like you're just throwing the shuttle back and forth back and forth beat change beat change throw beat change like it's so you have to really love three things, uh, methodical, uh, repetitive work. Um, you have to love really technical stuff. You need to be willing to get into the weeds with math and the weave structures, what makes a weave structure, what interlacements are and how fabric is made. And you also, this is just fact. You have to like being on your own. You have to enjoy quiet time because you can't drag your floor loom to your friend's knit night and you can't drag your floor loom to your guild meeting. Um, you can drag your looms around your house if you don't have a 150 pound floor loom like the jack. Um, I can't drag the jack around, but I can drag my spring around if I have to. Um, it's, it slides really nicely on our, on our hardwood floors. Um, and there's felt on the bottom, so I can just like literally drag it around, but you can't take your looms with you. So weavers tend to be quite solitary and they tend to be quite uh, studious in terms of wanting to read and get into the weeds with this stuff. And that's just fact. It's like playing the piano, all those hours of practice that happen behind the scenes, behind closed doors, and then you get to go out and perform, right? 
Um, it's kind of the same way with weaving. You do all those hours of practice behind closed doors by yourself, and then you can go out and show your finished object, show your finished tea towel, give that gift for the Christmas gift. And I think that that's something that's not talked about a lot. Like there's a reason why there's not tons and tons of weavers online. It's because they're pretty happy. You know, I'm pretty happy just sitting at my looms doing my own thing. And then I'm like, oh shoot, I have to share this. I need to, I need to make notes. And I think it's important to just be honest about that. Kelly says that's sort of where I am. I kind of want to branch out into it some more, but I'm not sure how much I want to dedicate it, dedicate to it. If I just want to try doing double head, so I just want to try doing double head stuff. I think that's a great, a great place uh, to be Kelly, to be honest. I'm thinking of getting on the rigid heddle so I could dabble in some weaving when I don't have the time really to delve into it as deeply as I would like to someday. Absolutely, Suzanne. I was talking to a master weaver local to us um, who's sort of a bit of a mentor of mine and she was even saying like it, it, between work and her weaving, you know, when she was working full time, she didn't have room to do a, a, you know, a master weaver program at all. Um, and so she would come home from working her full time job, which was very, very stressful um, frontline um, healthcare stuff uh, dealing with trauma. And she would come home and she would just weave for an hour or two just to kind of get it all out. And then she would move on with her evening with children and teenagers and grandkids and all that kind of stuff. And she was saying, you know, there just wasn't that space. Sometimes just weaving 40 inches of plain weave was what she needed to just bang it out. You know, you just beat it all out. Um, and I think that's really important to, to recognize. Um, space is a huge issue. I'm not really sure where I would put a floor loom. Suzanne, that's a great um, comment. I was going to comment on that actually. So, uh, we sold all of our furniture. I don't know for those who are just watching for the first time and are, um, maybe not aware of my story during COVID, we had some big, big conversations in our home, uh, about what we wanted our life to look like at post COVID, what was working, what wasn't working. We were all kind of on top of each other for those for that year. And one of the things that came up again and again and again was we want to live in our space. And what does that mean? And so we sold our living room furniture. We had three couches in here. We sold them. We had dining room furniture here. So there was a dining room table. There was a china cabinet here that was beautiful, I would like to say. Um, it was glass. It lit up. It was amazing. Um, I had uh, six dining room chairs we sold all of it. And um, I don't normally show you guys sort of behind the scenes stuff, but behind my desk here is my spring. So let me turn the camera. So for anybody who's motion sick, just close your eyes for just a moment. So the spring is back there. You can see my lights and the jack is in our living room. So let me show you that. So next to the jack is um, a big uh, oak cabinet that was my parents. And um, my dad decided um, when they got their new TV and went to a flat screen to get rid of it. And so we built shelving inside of it. So all of my weaving yarns and my fiber stash is in there. And the jack sits um, in, the, in the sort of half bay window. Um, and we have no more couches. So when people come over, like my friend Kylie yesterday, we sat in the family room. And we have one couch in there and one um, sort of, chair with a with an ottoman and in here we have two chairs that you can sit in their side tables um, so I can drag up a wheel or I can sit at the loom and visit with my mom when she's here or with Mike when he's reading and working on stuff so we've completely re-engineered our space if you guys would remember way back I used to podcast in our office and you might be thinking well why aren't you just using the office for those who've been around for a while why did you turn your dining room into an office and into a studio? The reason is better light. And the second reason was because one of the things that came out of COVID was bringing the kids home. So they go to school. I've kind of, um, uh, alluded to it on the podcast, but I haven't sort of come out and really told you guys. Um, after last year was a really, really tough year for the kids. It was very, very negative. They asked all year if they could please come back home to home learning like we had done during COVID. So they go to, they go to a brick and mortar school Mondays and Tuesdays, and then they do the rest of their learning. It's assigned by their teachers and they are at home Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So the office is now our school room and that's a work in progress. But right now they each have a desk in there. They've got their binders um, and they the Chromebook is in there so that they can work when they need to um, on the laptop. 
and if I have to I set them up in here and one of them is on each screen so it's been a total remake and a total redo of our of our life and how we do things and um, it's been it's been amazing it, it's it's intense I'm not gonna deny it it's intense but um, these 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 things have uh, really necessitated out of the conversation of, of how do we make our space work for us how do we live in our home and it's like we don't sit on couches we don't have people over to visit we don't have people over for dinner um, we don't have any family here if we get together with friends for dinner we generally go out to eat it's a great opportunity for us to try restaurants and go out um, so why are we creating space for that when that's not what we do so give yourselves permission to think outside the box. All right, let me catch up with chat and then we're going to say goodbye. We obviously do not have time for community participation today, so I obviously did not have to worry about it. Um, Josie says Rachel deserves uh, do many likes. Please press the like button. Thank you so much, Josie. That's so kind. Um, I wish I had listened to this a couple of years back, says Josie. I spin a default two ply fingering weight, so I'm pretty used to repetitive tasks. See, Heather, that's how I felt coming to weaving. For me, what got me really excited about the weaving was the science side. It was the experiment side, measuring and learning and understanding structure. Um, I am a homebody, so weaving might be my jam. Absolutely, Heather, when I sat down at a loom for the first time, I felt like I was coming home. Um, it was how I felt when I sat down at a piano. Um, thanks for sharing resources as well. I'm going to look at Liz Gibson um, when the stream is over. Yeah, Tizania, just uh, um, uh, Google the yarn worker. It'll come up. Great conversation, says Nathalie. Thank you, you guys. Fascinating explanation. Thank you, Holly. I'll be watching this episode more than once. Thank you. I did three heddles on my shacked flip. Very fiddly. Yeah, see, Charlotte, that was something I was wondering about. Liz Gibson is wonderful. I love her. Yes, isn't she amazing? I love her Patreon, too. It's it's really, really well done. Um, I love what you did with your living room, dining room setup. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, let me see. Let's see. Twills galore. Yes. Um, Absolutely. Uh, been lurking while plying. That's awesome, Zan. That makes so much sense, Rachel. We clearly have been on the same page. We re life and priorities in space this year. I'm excited to talk to you about that some more, um, Amanda. Um, my daughter says I live in a craft space with a kitchen and a bed. Absolutely, Sharon. Um, I think that I think there's something to using the space that you that you live and work in. Um, Alicia, great question. What are your weaving book, favorite weaving books? That's definitely something that we can um, get into next week for sure because I'm just uh, very aware of the time. So thank you for this conversation this week, you guys. We kind of ended up going a bit off off on a, on a tangent and I will change the title of the, um, uh, of the, the live stream so that so that people know to find this um that it's sort of talking about very weaving heavy and i'm glad that i'm glad that it was helpful for those of you who are, who are are interested in these things and are interested in um um you know getting into weaving or maybe making it a serious um part of your part of your making so until next week, thank you so much for being here. I hope that you guys have a wonderful um, rest of your week and a wonderful weekend. And I will see you guys on the other side next Saturday at the same time, same place. Bye, guys. Mm -hmm.